Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. I'm going to give you some advice, ladies and gentlemen. Lean back for this episode. All right? Lean back. You know what the show's about, politics, policy, and sometimes we emphasize more than others pop culture. Well, we're going to do a little politics, a little policy, and we're going to lean heavily into pop culture. Why? My guest is a gentleman named Joseph Cartagena, otherwise known as Fat Joe, Joey Crack, a legend in the hip-hop rap world. He's here in Washington, D.C. to talk about some policy and some politics. Fat Joe, it's great to see you. Pleasure. Pleasure to be here on your show, man. I heard so many amazing things about the show, so it's an honor for me to be on your show. Um, thanks for giving me the platform. Yeah. You know, it's very, very important. What, you, what, what, what brings you, I know, but I want you to tell my audience, what brings you to D.C.? Why are you traveling the halls of Capitol Hill? What's on your mind? Well, I've been advocating for patients' rights. You know, all over America, there's over 100 million Americans that are in ho hospital debt. And uh, this is a bipartisan issue. This isn't just Republican. This isn't Democrat. This is Amish, this is Native American, this is black, this is Jewish, this is Muslim, this is Latino. Everybody's getting beat up by these uh, hospitals and these uh, insurance companies. Because they don't know the prices. They don't know the prices. So basically, if we came in this taco place right now, it says on here mm -hmm. that a chicken fajita costs is eight ninety nine. Right. It's the only place in the world you can go to that doesn't show the prices. Of anything. Of anything. And so you got people in the same hospitals taking CAT scans for $12,000 and other people for 2000 Right. You know, uh, and so me, along with Power to the Patients, uh, we take this issue very, very serious. Mm -hmm. You mentioned we are at a taqueria, Santa Rosa taqueria. It has welcomed us before. We always thank them for their hospitality. But you're right. You have a menu. You drive down the street. You see the gas prices. You go into your grocery store. You go into your Nordstrom rack or wherever you pick up your clothes. There's a price. Mm -hmm. And you can evaluate right then and there. Yeah. What does that price mean to me? Now, obviously, in some instances... Healthcare can be of an urgent need and the price is secondary, but you'd still like to know. Hey, there's a woman who has a bracelet uh, on her hand that says, if I get sick, please don't call 911. Put me in an Uber. That's how expensive the ride of the ambulance costs to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she wants to eliminate vary. that. And that can vary. You don't, know, you, you don't know what the cost is. From ambulance company to ambulance company. So you don't know. And so there's people out there that do pay attention. You know, the vast majority of Americans, you know, they look at it like this is what I got to pay. They know they're getting robbed, but don't know quite how they're getting robbed. Mm -hmm. Then you got them people really, really intelligent that look for the data and look at the data and saying, hey, what's this cost right here? What's that? And so these hospitals, there's actually a law already that Trump passed, but was never enforced. And so we came out here talking about enforcement, and then- They've written just, a rule, but the rule is not altogether put together in the hospitals. And most people don't know they have access to it. Most people don't know how they're complying with it. So there is a process, but it's not really working. It's not working. The system is broken. The system is rigged. Um, that's even better. Mm -hmm. The system is rigged. You know, you got people in America that are wobbling across the street that are afraid to walk in the hospital because they got to pay their bills. And if they're trying to live the American dream and send their son and daughter to college, they can't even do that because of the, the prices of the bill. And from your perspective, it doesn't matter whether you have insurance or not. Yes, it does matter, but this price issue still plays either way. Yeah, we just got to Uberize the system. And so what happens in America, there's a lot of... Um, systems in place that we like to call dinosaur mm -hmm. you know our forefathers made it up 130 years ago right. they didn't know there was going to be facetime <laughs> they didn't know you were going to be in 75 different stations like <laughs> yeah, right i mean and so we're still living by that by those rules and regulations so you know this is uh an idea whose time has come mm -hmm. and we're telling the insurance companies and we're telling the hospitals you know, you guys made a ton of money mm -hmm. off of the Americans. We woke up. 
We want to see the prices. We don't want to estimate because the new term they're bringing out is like, no, we'll give you an estimate. Well, what's an estimate? Right. Why you can't just tell us the prices like everything else? Because you know they know the price. Well, we would know the price if they showed us the right, but data. But internally, they know how much they're going to they charge They know you. the price, but listen, I met with a group of employers um, who turned the whole thing around. One employer opened up their own clinic. One employer does steel out of Montana where he is the insurer now. Mm -hmm. And so he dealt with the hospitals and he realized they didn't want to work with him. And then when they finally gave him the data, they seen how much profit the hospital were making. Not for the actual procedure. Mm -hmm. It was just a level of profit to where they said, you know, we're going to do this. Of course, you need the employees to get on board. Mm -hmm. Um to get educated as well so they can know the benefits of it. But they drove the cost, the cost down and actually put more money into the pockets of the employees. And so there's ways to do it. And they know this could get fixed. They know they could fix this. But obviously, you know, we live in a society that's just totally based on profit. Right. So for my audience, they say, wait a minute. Your audience is very smart, by the way. Fat Joe, he grows up in the Bronx, housing project, Grammy-nominated rapper. What does he know about the, How did he even get involved in this? Well, I have a good friend sitting behind you. His name is Kevin Moore. He's one of the founders of Power to the Patient. So he cornered me in and said, Joe, you got to hear me out. And once I heard him out, he brought me to a woman named Cynthia Fisher, uh, who's just unbelievably passionate about this. And she broke down so many scenarios where I was like, you know, I got to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? When Fat Joe the rapper says he's going to take on the hospitals and the health insurance, all my people who love me tell me I'm crazy. How are you going up against big hospital? How are you going to? So they got this reputation of the big bad wolf. Mm -hmm. But um, like in many other instances, when you stand up to them and you get the data, uh, the empirical data, I mean, the numbers don't lie. And so they have to come with you or you look for alternatives. Mm -hmm. And hip hop has always been very disruptive. And I got brothers like Chuck D on board from Public Enemy who uh, won't sell a soul for nothing. And so when he saw this, he said, Joe, commendable. You know, I had all the a, all a conscious rappers, KRS-One, he says, now, KRS-One will not take a check from... He, he just doesn't want to be part of any system. He says, that's, com that's my thing. That's what I'm commendable about. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing right, Joe. Mm -hmm. You know, he don't want to hear about material items or nothing like right. that. So those guys on that end of the spectrum applaud these efforts very much because at the end of the day, you're speaking up for the people. So now when I walk through the airport and I walk through different places, I have random people just hugging me and start telling me about, thank you for fighting for us. Thank you for fighting for our rights. Thank you for fighting for the health care transparency. So many people are dealing with it. It's 100 million Americans. Does that make you feel a different sense of connection to your audience, to your fans, than you did before when you well, were an advocate? Well, hip-hop doesn't get its just due. Now, to say that hip-hop is totally organized, where we have a union <laughs> for the pioneers and all that, that doesn't exist. No. But individually, hip hop artists such as Jay Z, he's attacked mm -hmm. justice reform in yep. a major way. Yep. Yep. You know, generating millions and millions of dollars to help. And so, this is my thing. Right. You know, this is what I wanted to tackle on. This is how yeah. I wanted to help the average everyday American. Mm -hmm. That is the voice of Fat Joe, Joe Cartagena, as he's also known. I said lean back. Why did I say lean back? One of his biggest hits, folks. Now, did I know that two weeks ago? No, I didn't. I will fess up to that. <laughs> I'm evolving in front of your very eyes. More uh -huh. with Fat Joe when we come back. I'm Major Garrett. This is The Takeout. You could be looking so discouraged. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? We, we coming out of here with the win. Like, I'm crazy like that. Welcome back to the Takeout Santa Rosa Taqueria on Capitol Hill is our host restaurant. Always grateful to them. Fat Joe is our guest. Fat Joe, so you've been walking around Capitol Hill. What's that like, meeting lawmakers, doing the conversation one-on-one? -on -one? 
Well, you know, I don't get involved with nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. So I, I always take a winning approach. Mm-hmm. I speak it into existence, and I play it out. And so we came over here maybe like three years ago. We met with one politic, only one with me with us. Gentleman from Kentucky. What's his name, Kev? Because we got to give him his props. The man from Ken- Kentucky. Comfrey. Guthrie is the only guy who met with us. And he sat down at this. Then we came back two years, and it was like 40 politicians. Mm-hmm. And we came back last year, it was 80 politicians. Mm-hmm. So you actually see the growth. Mm-hmm. You actually see uh, that they get it. And you see momentum going. And so Congress passed a law recently um, with Frank Pallone and Mm -hmm. Hakeem Jeffries. And it's a start. It's great. It's great, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. Now it's going on to Senate. Mm -hmm. And we got to convince the Senate that this is an issue that's bipartisan. Right. This is the issue for the people. And sometimes even me... I've been a rap superstar for 30 years. Right. I get numb and I, get, and I lose focus of how I got here. And so some of the senators, you know, have to realize that they've been elected by the people to get mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. And so I know there's lobbyists, special, special interests, there's yep. all these type of people. But at the core, I just want you to look at yourself as a young politician and why you got into the game and make a change for the American people because this is something that's really destroying lives all over America. Two things I want to ask you about what you just said. One, three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, the growth moving through the house, that's progress, yet it's still slow. Oh. Americans get discouraged sometimes about the slowness of our system. Do you get discouraged? No. Okay. Because I'm crazy. I'm like, uh, <laughs> no. I'm being honest with you. I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm like, uh, I think his name was Bugsy Siegel, the guy who went out there in the desert and yep. created Vegas. Yep. yep. I'm one of them guys. I come up in here. That you could be looking so discouraged. I'm like, what are you talking about, man? We, we coming out of here with the win. Like, I'm crazy like that. Yeah. You know. And so I'm very optimistic. Um, and like I said, uh. We've worked so hard. I mean, we, we got people from Montana with us, mm-hmm. people from Kansas, people from S- St. Kentucky, Louis, people from New, New Jersey, York, Missouri, people yep. from, I mean, this is, a, this, is a, this is an issue that affects all Americans. Mm-hmm. So I'm very, very optimistic. So you mentioned also, this is the other thing, hip hop disruptor has that disruptor spirit. What is the disruption that the hospitals are afraid of? What's the pushback you get on this? You know, it's the bottom line. You know, they've been eating, they've been eating fat for a long time. And so, uh, you know, them giving up the data, them being transparent, hurts their pocket a little bit. Me and you would be so happy to own a hospital, mm-hmm. right? I mean, but these guys are so used to a certain amount of money that they're like, no, they're pushing back. Mm-hmm. But, you know, at one time there was a rotary phone, then came the cell phone, then came the TV, the color TV, the big TV, the flat screen. This idea whose time has come. And so you got to comply with the people. Otherwise, the people are going to know that you're just taking advantage of them. And, And these prices are being raised not because that's what it costs for the surgery or that's what it's called. This is all fluff going back into all these middleman's pockets Mm -hmm. so those are the guys really fighting back i have talked to people who have come to washington optimistic like you are energized like you are and sometimes they walk away and they say to themselves wait a minute that politician man or woman republican or democrat said yes but i can't tell if they're just patting me on the head so i leave or they're really serious do you have a sense when you go in there whether people are serious? Yeah, it was or night and day. Saying, I mean, saying we, what you want to hear so well, you'll move on down no, the road. Oh, we just passed something in Congress. Uh, we passed the law in New York City. Now we got to uh, implement the enforcement. It's the first time in New York City that they uh, passed the health transfer. First time in New York, New mm-hmm. York City. Mm-hmm. So New York City so was you named care about after this at a local York, level, state in, level, uh, federal everywhere. level. Like we just trying to. Anybody that feels that they don't have a voice, mm-hmm. that they're going through a hard time, 
in America, mm -hmm. if they hear Fat Joe just utter what they're thinking and it benefits them and it helps them, that gives me a sense of uh, love and encouragement, mm -hmm. you know, because I stand up for the people. You know, when, to be honest with you, when I move through the Capitol, it's not so much the politicians who say, hey, that's Fat Joe. It's the workers. Mm -hmm. It's the janitors. It's the people that work in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. It's the aides to the politician. It's the little guy that looks at Fat Joe and correlate with me and feel that, mm -hmm. that bond. And so, uh, just like they did when you came up the stairway here at Santa Rosa Taqueria. That's, that's who I'm for. I'm for the little guy, the little woman in America. Mm -hmm. You know, the voiceless who's screaming and barking at the moon. They feel like they get nothing done on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Is anyone paying you for this advocacy? No. I mean, um, this is from the heart, man. We hear from the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything we do is from the heart, you know. And so, uh, do you have a personal experience that got you into this issue? Not a personal issue per se, but a good friend of mine, who's, who I told you sitting behind you for 20 years, uh, Kevin Moore, he broke it down to me. And then once I started speaking up about this to uh, people, I just started hearing so many stories of people around me that were impacted by this. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, all right, I got to use my voice for this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that circulates around this issue is you've got the hospitals, and you've got the insurers, mm -hmm. and you've got the federal government, which pays for some of this care. And they're all sort of okay with it. They're all kind of like, shh, because everyone's mm -hmm. kind of... All right with well, it. Well, we, we, we put such a spotlight on this now mm -hmm. that if you don't vote for it, shame on you. Right. Because we know. Because right now we just did a poll and 94% of Americans voted for health transparency. Price transparency. And the other, yes. And, and, and the other 6% the other probably obviously ain't know what the poll was because they would have voted for it too. Mm-hmm. And so we know what the people want. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, are they going to enforce it? Yeah. Are they going to come on the side of the people? So, so in the real, in the in the in the ideal world, Fat Joe, you and I find ourselves in the emergency room on the same day. In the ideal world, what do we get? Do we get a piece of paper that's got the? No, prices? You get nothing, and most people go in there under the arrest. In the ideal world, if this is if this is done. We get what? We get a piece of paper that's oh, got yeah, prices on it? Oh, yeah, it says the prices on it. Right. That's right. It says the prices on it. Before now, what happens in a normal, not just an emergency, normal, you got to take a, a, a colonoscopy. Right. Right? You can look up your three favorite hospitals, if you want to call it that. Right. Right? And one of them is charging 12000 one is charging 8000 one is charging 2000 Right. Obviously, we're going to where it's for $2,000. Right. Or you might go to the one in the middle. Who knows? It all depends. Whatever. They, know. I don't know who wants to pay more for the same test. Right. But um, it's like everything else. And, it, and it's a time. The system has to get Uberized. Mm -hmm. I call it Uberized. Because mm -hmm. it's running on a dinosaur system. Right. And the system ain't helping the people. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be transparent so we can know and make our choice. Like we do in everything else in life. You know, uh... And so that's what I'm praying for most. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're here in Washington. That's right. And that's why you're talking not only to members of the House, but members of the Senate. Mm -hmm. That's trying, right. Trying to get the Senate in gear. Well, everybody plays his part. Right. And so what I'm trying to explain to the, to the House, who already passed the law, um, is that if you, if, you meet, if you see guys from the Senate at the cafeteria... Right. See him talk it up. Talk it up. Talk, talk it up. up. And if enough people talk it up. Right. Because you know we got Israel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gaza. Lots of things. Lots of things. Ukraine. Lots of things. Uh, yeah. You know, nobody could get along. Speak. Are we going to pass the budget? Right. Are we, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of distractions going on. Speaking of talking it up, we will do more of that when we come back. I'm Major Garrett. Fat Joe is with us. Segment three of the takeout coming your way. She turns on my Instagram live. And before you knew it... 
Michelle Obama was on there commenting. K uh, Kim Kardashian. Welcome back to The Takeout. Fat Joe is our special guest. You know, on Instagram, he has 5.7 million followers, which is about 5,600,995 more than I have. <laughs> Just so we're clear. Um, Hip-hop and its disruptor ethic. Is there a part of you and your approach to this that is also disruptive? Do you use other platforms to get this out? Do you yeah. talk about this in non-traditional ways? I've been talking about this in 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 Tamron Hall, uh, on on regular TV, The View, uh, hmm? Bloomberg, <laughs> wherever they Bloomberg would fall into the traditional category. They, I think wherever they turn on <laughs> that camera, mm -hmm. I go. And uh, it's a part of my daily and life. Do you use your own platforms as well, Instagram? Of course, I have a show on Instagram Live that I started in COVID. Okay. Because I'm, you know, I'm diabetic, and I was really, really scared when COVID hit. Uh, first time in a hundred years, and so I felt like my fans were just as scared as me. So my daughter, 14 years old at the time. She was my executive producer, was stuck in the house. <laughs> and so she turns on my Instagram live. And before you knew it, Michelle Obama was on there commenting, K uh, Kim Kardashian. I had Dr. Fauci mm -hmm. on my Instagram live. Uh, you name it, they came on there. Anybody, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Cory Book, uh, uh, Andrew Yang, uh, whoever you name was on there. Uh, Eric Adams, before he became mayor, he, he chased me because, you know, we, can we curse on here? No. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. We usually about <laughs> the police, right? In hip hop. Right. So we look at <laughs> Mayor Adams like he was the police. Right. right? And so I, I was avoiding this guy and everybody kept coming. He finally caught me. He said, Joe, I swear, man. I got to get on your platform, man. I got to talk to the people. Mm -hmm. And so I said, all right, come on. And he did great. Uh, I asked him on the show, would he save this school in the Bronx that they were going to close down? And he gave me his word, and he saved the school. Okay. So, I, you know, the man's a man of his word. And so uh, we got people through the COVID. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we have a TV show coming out on Stars, mm -hmm. um, which is a talk show. Right. Slash, you know, like I said, it always got to be disruptive. Right. So it's almost like an Anthony Bourdain without the food, uh -huh. <laughs> but more about culture. Culture. Okay. And, and then and going around, seeing good. artists, seeing this, seeing that. You never know who I bump into. Mm -hmm. Like if I was shooting now, I'd have been like, I'm doing your show, but you got to be on my show. <laughs> right. Right? Right. right? And people would find you interesting in your story. Uh, possibly. You know, and so, <laughs> no, they would. No, they would. You know, and... uh. And people need to learn about other people. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I had a dentist yesterday. She's from Israel. And she said she knew nothing about the ghetto or the inner city. Other than what she read or saw in a movie. Mm -hmm. I never knew people exist like this. This is in America. Mm -hmm. But I had to tell her a little bit of my story. She right. told me her, her father was a Holocaust survivor that lived close enough to hear the Hitler speeches in person. You know how scary that must have been? Cannot imagine. This yeah. unthinkable. Right. But you know, this is interesting. Yep. If I had the right. camera on, right. the audience would be like, wow. Like, you know, um, and so I, I just find interesting things in everybody's journey, everybody's Tell my journey. audience a little bit about your journey. Begins Me? in the Bronx, yeah. Man, uh, the Bronx looked like Ukraine, a war zone. Mm -hmm. It was referred uh, to as that. No, no, it was. Yeah. It looked like, aesthetically, mm -hmm. the building we played on rubble. Born we in 1970, were you not? Yep. Born in 1970. But the beauty of it is that hip-hop was formed out of the Bronx when I was only three years old. So, And not only that, was born in my neighborhood of the Bronx. So I would come out my door and Grandmaster Flash and uh, Melly Mel and 
and Shah Rock, the first female rapper of history, was from my block. The first Latino rapper, Ruby D, was from my block. So me as a fan, I was just I, I was just born in the mecca of hip hop music, and obviously, uh, I wanted to become a rapper and a recording artist. Uh, I had a rough life growing up. I made a lot of bad choices that I'm not happy. Um, and uh, I thank God for hip hop that I was able to come out of there. Mm -hmm. and I got my start at the Apollo Theater. You know, if you suck, they throw apples at you. <laughs> so I've heard uh, that. imagine I, I, I left a life of crime mm -hmm. to go rap and humble myself. And I won four weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. And I met DJ Red Alert, who was the number one DJ in America at the time. Mm -hmm. He said, I like you. Do you have a song? So I gave him my song. And then that later became number one in America, Flo Jo, and, and the rest is history. Right. Mm -hmm. When you were young and you idolize these people around you. Which the, people we talking about? Uh, the, the, music? the the, the, the yeah. original rappers, the, the names you just dropped. I still worship them. If I saw them outside right now, jump out the car and start giving them praise. Really, okay. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and my connection with them is A1. And they call mm -hmm. me Little Angel. They don't even call me Fat Joe. Right. Like I'm really from the neighborhood, Right. you know? And you mentioned a moment ago that you made some bad choices. I've read that you have, looking back on your childhood, thought there were times you were kind of a bully, maybe had that sort of... Well, I got bullied. And you got bullied, okay. So I got beat up every day by 20 guys. Every single day for two years straight. Still went back to... My mother and father didn't believe. They, they forced me back in school. So I don't have a picture at Christmas or Easter without a black eye or a bloody lip. No kidding. Because I was always tough. So I would fight these 20 guys mm -hmm. every day, you know, and, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it turned me for the worse. You know, when I went to high school over the summer, I turned into a pretty bad guy. And then what's terrible about it is when you become the bully, you're almost like a neighborhood celebrity that everybody's getting. When you walk through, the girls are like, oh, mm. who's that? Joey Crack. Oh, and it, that adrenaline. Uh, pulls you towards the dark side, you know? And so I lived pretty dark mm -hmm. at that time. I mean, till hip hop saved my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you say there is anything in your lyrics that is part of the dark side? Everything. And so uh, it's just a reflection of the street, whether it's my story, mm -hmm. it's everybody else's story. You know, hip hop, we, we're the journalists of the streets. Yeah. And so, if you want to know what's going on in, in Cuba, just pick up Cuban hip hop. You want to know what's going on in Ukraine for real right now? Pick up Ukrainian hip hop right now. And so it's, it's, it's always a reflection of the oppressed people and they got something to say. Mm -hmm. And so that's what hip hop is. And so we got to talk about what we see in our community mm -hmm. or what we've been through firsthand. You know, that's what hip hop's about. I've never heard that before, and I'm fascinated by that since my entire life has been about journalism, journalists of the street. Yes, we are. That's what hip-hop is. You know, my, my favorite rapper is named KRS-One. He's a conscious rapper, but in his album cover, by any means necessary, he's posted at a window, almost like Malcolm X with a big gun in his hand. And so I, I'm not going to lie. I bought it for gangster hip-hop. And then when I turned it on and I got on the train, he said, airplanes flying, overseas people dying, politicians lying. I'm trying not to escape, but hit the problem head on by bringing out the truth in the song. Now, BDP short for Boogie Down Production. And so what was happening was like he, a whole flower blossomed in my mind. I was like, oh my God, like, what is this guy talking about? And that's what I mean. He was a journalist mm -hmm. for hip hop. He's, he's, he's exposing the irregularities and what goes on in the ghetto. And when critics said it's too violent, you would say that's a reflection of the reality. Yes, and it's entertainment. So now I'm not over here trying to put Mario Puzo in jail mm -hmm. or Martin Scorsese. I'm just loving that. And after I see The Godfather, I turn it off and I watch a J-Lo Wedding Crasher movie, which is funny. <laughs> you get it? So it's like, it's just entertainment. 
It's, it's entertainment. Art. Speaking it, it, of entertainment, that's what we have here. Fat Joe, take segment four of the takeout in just a second. You got so many fake people in entertainment. Like I watch people have the worst conversation in the world. Somebody asks for a pitch and go. Welcome back to Takeout. Welcome back to Santa Rosa Taqueria near Capitol Hill. Fat Joe is our special guest. Man, what a great show this is and will continue to be. So, uh, Jamie Benson, one of our most productive, influential, and valuable producers, is our resident hip-hop rap expert. And he sent me an article this morning, Fat Joe, mm -hmm. giving me the eras of rap and hip-hop. This was an article written last year at the 50th anniversary of hip-hop. Mm -hmm. And they were broken down as such. Old school, 1979 to 1983. Golden age, 1983 to 1997. Conscious wave, 83 to 2000. East versus West, 91 to 97. Bling era, 97 to 2006. <laughs> Conscious resurgence, 2004 to now. And alternative revival, 2006 to now. In which would you say your career most exemplifies of those? You know, I've been rapping since 93. Right. Uh, and so I love them all, but I would be more of a reflection. Like, uh, I guess I'll I guess I'll say the golden era, mm -hmm. but it's different for me because you got it all right, but the golden era to me is LL Cool J, KRS One, Salt and Pepper, Kumo D, uh, Grandmaster Flash, The Furious Five, The Fat Boys. I mean, uh, Queen Latifah, MC Light, Big Daddy Kane. These people were like untouchable. Mm -hmm. And so what we have now is more of a saturated market with, you know, they download, new artists download 100,000 records a week to Spotify now. Right. At that time, we had a good 10. <laughs> and so we could really zero in on the artists. Right, right. So uh, that's my favorite era. But my biggest eras are from the 2000s on mm -hmm. is when I put out number ones in America. Right. And so, uh, you know, that, that's what everybody would know Fat Joe for. Lean back, what's love, mm -hmm. you know. Make that era. All the way up. Big boys. Yeah. Big boys. How has the industry changed during your career? What's, or what's the most important change? Social media. Your, social media. Yeah, so you said the Instagram number is 5.7, but my Facebook is 4 million. Okay. My Twitter is a couple of million. And so you press one button and 12 million people see what you're saying. Yeah. Plus everybody else eyeballs that, that, that go on it. And so I tell you... I tell the young artists, I said, we didn't have this. I would go, all right, you, you, you don't know Fat Joe, right? <laughs> so I started from a graffiti culture. And graffiti is all about, it's a subculture that you put your name everywhere and enough kids that's in the graffiti, they see your name and that's, you're like out for fame, right? And so I took the same approach in guerrilla marketing. When I had my record flow jar, I was standing outside a train station with little flyers like this that said, hey, I'm Fat Joe, Flo Joe. Mm -hmm. To people, me. The record was number one in America, and I was like, hey, I'm Fat Joe, Flo Joe, so you can make the connection. At night, I would take posters and take buckets of glue and put them all over New York City. You were doing myself. that. Myself. I would come home. I don't want to make the reference, but I would come home almost looking like 9-11 when you see the mm -hmm. dust that was on them. Every single night, I would come home like a ghost with the, with the glue on me, just putting my name out there, going to every club, giving my, you know, that's how I met Notorious B.I.G., rest in peace, Biggie. Mm -hmm. I was giving the DJ my single. And, you know, everything had to be hand-in-hand. -hand. Now you have a young kid, could be from anywhere in the world, presses the button, it's a TikTok sensation, they're out of here. Yeah. They're superstars. Yeah. Overnight. They that's can get, the they difference. Can, meaning they can get a contract. Big time. Yeah. Because, the, the, you know, because when you record labels don't A&R no more. Yeah. Rec when I started, getting a contract was a, 
impossible. Right. So what happens is now the, the record labels aren't into uh, making the next artist. They just look at the market and see what radio station, what's streaming the most. Who's this new artist that's streaming out of they Memphis? They capture. They'll go down there, give them a deal. Right. And so now it's about the artists creating their own buzz, creating their own movement. And if they understood what I understood, your best bet would to be independent, keep your own masters, and put more profit in your pocket. Because just like Capitol Hill and Washington, uh, there's funny math in music. <laughs> Big time. Talk to Very me. dinosaur. I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because, <laughs> because Taylor Swift has tried to re-alter those Smart woman. economics. Talk to me about that from an artist's perspective. I'm going to tell you something that, I ha that I'm privy to know. Uh, just knowing the business, she has one of the best deals in music originally. Mm -hmm. How about that one? Okay. Her, her business structure was already for the win. Right. And she started independent. I saw a whole journey since she started. You know, Taylor Swift is one of the only people. Because there's so many fake people in entertainment. Like, I watch people have the worst conversation in the world. Somebody asks for a pitch and go. And take, like, they so BS. Yeah. Uh -huh. She's the only one I believe is a nice person. Mm -hmm. How you about that it. one? I actually, it. I would be a sucker. Mm hmm if she wasn't a nice person. Right. I tell it. my wife all the time, this is the only one I believe, right? Because she's such a nice person to me. But her business structure was already great to begin with. But then she realized, hey, they're still robbing me. Right. And so she got to get it back. Um, Taylor's version. Yeah, because a lot of, a lot of artists... Wow, just tell them what that means to take that back. So what happens is these record companies, when you come and you get in the game... They're like the Wizard of Oz. They're behind the curtain. Yeah. We could make you this and this and that. So you're like, sure, I'll sign here. Right? And then once you in the game and you got skin in the game, you start realizing, He's got, I'm unrecoup. I mean, right now, to tell you, I put out an album independently. Mm -hmm. I sell 300,000 records. I make millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I have albums with... Uh, major record labels where I sold two and a half million records and I'm still unrecouped 20 years later. Where's the math? Right. We, I mean, this is just more than obvious. I sell a couple of hundred thousand, I make millions of dollars. I sold millions of records and we still ain't get a dollar. I mean, it's funny math. And so what artists have been doing, especially old school artists, have been taking the power back into their hands and they've been re- Doing their own songs. Redoing their own catalog. So they catalog. can own their own masters. Right. So when a movie wants to hear, uh, I like it like that, yeah, baby, the artist actually makes a dollar. Yeah. Right. The creator. <laughs> the creator. Yeah, the creator yeah. is what Taylor Swift right. is doing. And you admire her for that. I love her. Man, I like everything about her. Um, she's a very, very sweet person. Uh, she's a great ambassador for music. Mm -hmm. And we are going to end on that note because we got to go. Stay tuned for your takeout, Outtake Especial. Fat Joe will be a part of that. But Fat Joe, it's been a pleasure, man. Thanks Thank for you so much, brother. We'll see you next week. I'm listening to everything from the Delphonics to Stylistics uh, to Nita Baker. Luther Vandross, my favorite singer of all time. Welcome to your takeout outtake especial. We are in Santa Rosa Taqueria near Capitol Hill. Our special guest, Fat Joe, otherwise known by his birth name, Joe Cartagena, Joey Crack, world famous, legendary rapper, hip hop artist. So I want to ask you three questions. We ask every guest. This show is in, believe it or not, it's eighth year. Everyone's taking these questions on, and I can't <laughs> wait to hear your answers. Okay. So take these in whatever order you prefer, Fat Joe. Well, just give me one at a time. I'll answer. All right. Most influential book in your life and why? Both inf influential book in my life. Uh, I believe uh, 
It was a book I read about, I don't know the actual name, about Martin Luther King, who I feel is the greatest American ever. Um, and he chose love over hate. He, he, he chose to unify the people mm -hmm. more than divisiveness. All-time favorite movie or one of your most favorite movies? You mentioned The Godfather earlier. Yeah, it's either The Godfather or Bronx Tale. And uh, take your time with this one. You're on a long drive. You're on a long flight. And you are going to put your headphones on and really immerse yourself. What's that music going to be? Man, that, that music is uh, R&B music. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to everything from the Delphonics, the Stylistics, uh, to Anita Baker, Luther Vandross, my favorite singer of all time, Shaw Day, Stephanie Mills, Anita Baker. Um, you know, that's, that's my souvenir. You know, yesterday, my biggest fear in life, I fear no man. God gave me that. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. I fear. I've seen warlords mm -hmm. in, in country. The worst people, and I'm not scared of them. I'm a scared of flying. Flying, and I, and I fly all the time. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, that flight coming here was so scary that my neighbor hugged me when we landed. Everybody started screaming, "This is the worst flight!" Then I picked up the local news. And they said it rained more. It hasn't rained this hard since 1817 mm -hmm. in Washington. And, and they shut down the bridge for hurricane winds. What the hell are we doing flying into Washington in this thing? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't get it. It was a hairy flight, So man. I had Michael Jackson, uh, the, we're almost there. <laughs> we're, and this thing is like, <laughs> and I'm like, God, you're the greatest God. I realized that. The airplane has now become my place of worship. Okay. It's my church now. So from the minute I sit there till I land, I'm praying for every God, you would never let nothing happen to that little kid. God, you don't want the rabbi to get hurt. God, come on. You see that lady? Somebody's grandmother. She's so nice. That's right. Don't know. And so I, I start praying mm -hmm. on this plane for two hours, three hours, four hours. And so it's my new place of worship. Right. The Church of Fill in the Blank, American Airlines, Delta, United, Spirit, whatever, Alaska. Maybe really Alaska, but I'll set that Oof. aside. Frat Joe, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Thanks, brother. Man. I appreciate, I appreciate the time. We'll see you next week, folks.